Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week... The suspects were controlled and directed by Moscow. A news divide worthy of the Cold War. The media in Washington and Moscow and their reporting of the Russian spy story. The Pentagon and the new rules of journalistic engagement after the fall of General McChrystal. We go to that other former colony in Southeast Asia to check out the state of the news media in Macau and a belated Father's Day greeting card in our web video of the week. Every once in a while, we run into a media story that virtually writes itself. The case of those alleged Russian spies arrested in the U.S. most definitely falls into that category. Like many stories from the shadowy world of espionage, this one is short on detail, long on speculation, laced with intrigue and mystery, and sprinkled with the kind of Cold War terminology that one might have thought would have disappeared along with the Berlin Wall. The fact that there are lots of allegations, but very few facts, has not always restrained the American media in its reporting. Nor has it stopped the Russian news media from, if not jumping to the defense of the accused, going on the offense against the legitimacy of the story and the way it's been reported. That's our starting point this week, the Russian spy story and the case against the news media's coverage of it. Ten alleged members of a Russian spy ring have been arrested by the FBI for trying to... One news story, three dominant themes. It's a flashback to the Cold War. But First, the almost anachronistic Cold War angle. The suspects were controlled and directed by Moscow. Then there was the salacious angle. About this beautiful girl who is... The real-life Bond girl making a YouTube spectacle of herself. Uh, men are saying that if she really was a spy, then they would have told her anything. Angle number three, the incompetence or the alleged incompetence of the operation. Here's the strange part. No state secrets were stolen as far as... And no intelligence story in the U.S. would be complete without somebody dropping the T-word. You know, in this day and age, you think they're terrorists, you have no idea. Journalists love nothing better than writing about um, spy stories, partly because most journalists wish they were spies. Two agents secretly handing off information. So when a story like this comes along, I'm afraid all uh, rational reporting goes out the window. I think somebody once called uh, spy reporting a wilderness of mirrors and uh, you sometimes have to dig pretty deeply to make sure you're getting the true story because there is a lot of spin involved and, and people do have an agenda. Rewind for a moment and consider. The media had been spoon-fed a story through a U.S. court by an American intelligence agency. Journalism 101 teaches reporters to consider the source and to ask not just the question why, but why now. Why did the U.S. government fold up this case when they did? Only a few days after the Medvedev visit to Washington resulted in a declaration by Russia and America that they were going to enter a new era of close relations. Those are questions that really interest me, uh, which are not necessarily questions that would either occur to the general news reporter or that the general news reporter would be able to get any information on. The FBI is one of 17 intelligence agencies, and we have to look at the timing of this information, why it was released now. All those intelligence agencies in America have been under huge pressure since 9-11 to prove themselves. I think the good security correspondents have looked beyond the headlines and said, hang on a moment, what's in this for the FBI? Why are they releasing this now? Uh, and I think a lot of other reporters have swallowed the whole thing hook, line, and sinker uh, and not really looked at the politics behind it. There is the suggestion that someone at the FBI might not have approved of the warmed-up relations between Washington and Moscow and used this case to cast a chill over the so diplomacy. The president yep. met with uh, Medvedev. It also helps if you have a conservative news outlet that's ready to serve, like Fox News. The Russians are not our friends. The Chinese are not our friends in these types of areas. The Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians, they are all trying to infiltrate the United States. They are all trying to infiltrate our national security apparatus. The constant request for money, the fact that they couldn't get their expensive technology to work. Fox was not the only news outlet to make the supposed spy network look like amateur hour, but it used Judith Miller to do that. Miller is a reporter best known for buying the Bush administration's so-called intelligence on Iraqi weapons of mass destruction and writing about it repeatedly in the influential New York Times. May we always have such incompetent spies, people using invisible ink and Morse code. When I watched her on Fox News, she was saying, long live incompetent spies, which I do think has a certain um, ring of irony about it. Um, I'm sure um, 
various spies who planted stories in the Western media might well be saying, long live incompetent journalists. Well, we've learned a lot from these federal court documents that read like a spy thriller. As many American and British news outlets quoted court documents and recited allegations as fact, others, like Russia's state-funded English-language news channel, explored theoretical motivations. The intelligence agencies in the U.S. have been very much under attack over the last uh, year or two for a whole number of reasons. Their involvement in things like extraordinary rendition, torture, surveillance of domestic political activists, things like that. So to go to an old-fashioned, good old-fashioned Cold War spy story and regain a bit of credibility, I think it's probably uh, something that they would aspire to. Russian news outlets do provide a different perspective, a useful one but they are not without an agenda of their own. Well, the state-controlled Russian media has suggested that the timing of the announcement of these arrests were organized by rogue elements in the U.S. government to maximize damage to bilateral relations. The second way it's been covered in the state-controlled Russian media is to kind of downplay the whole affair, bringing in elements of irony and humor, describing it as a soap opera, uh, that these people, these suspects, uh, in no way gleaned any sort of sensitive information or uh, any information whatsoever that could possibly uh, harm the interests of the United States. Living in the U For media consumers, the way to look at stories like this one is to do what journalists are supposed to do, consider the source. For the most part, the information originates with intelligence agencies, be it the FBI or CIA in the U.S., the SVR in Russia, or Britain's SIS, also known as MI6. There is a department in MI6 called IOPS, which um, simply specializes in planting stories in the Western media. Gradually, drip by drip, information is planted in the media to suit the agenda. And I think that has become much more influential in the 21st century with things like, obviously, the internet, uh, first and foremost, but with YouTube and with um, global TV and the newspapers. So we always have to be aware of that. There's a term that goes back almost 200 years, used to describe the strategic rivalry between Russia and Britain in Central Asia. They called it the Great Game. Spying was always a big part of that. Now, in the 21st century, the game goes on, and the media are big players, whether they know it or not. And here's how our Global Village Voices see the reporting of the Russian spy story. Usually security services construct uh, media coverage on this type of situations since they use media for sending a message to the other side, in this case Russia. But in this situation I was especially fascinated by the role of social media since some of the heroes, the so-called spies, uh, had a very developed online presence. And a lot of people went not to traditional media, but to social networks to study about these people. It means that in new information age, even if you're a spy, you have to have a profile on Facebook. Reporters love trolling through the accused spy's surprisingly copious online trail. But by relying so heavily on online and social networking tools accessible to anyone, reporters are essentially inviting the same accusations of irrelevance as the accused spies themselves that their jobs could have been done just as easily and a lot more cheaply by anyone with a access to the internet and a good knack for Google. If you've got a beef over the way that news is covered and you'd like to get it on the air as one of our Global Village voices, Facebook and Twitter are the best ways to go. We've now got more than 4,000 fans on Facebook. Many of them go there to find out what stories we're working on so they can weigh in with an opinion on the media. Or you can just get in touch with us via email at listening post at aljazeera.net. Time now for some Listening Post news bites, starting with something from our It Was a Matter of Time file. It took only nine days after the replacement of General Stanley McChrystal for the Pentagon to issue new rules that will tighten control over the military's engagement with the media. McChrystal gave up his position as the commander of multinational forces in Afghanistan following the publication of a series of interviews that he did with Rolling Stone magazine. The new rules come from Defense Secretary Robert Gates, and they will require all top-level Pentagon and military leaders to get clearance for any interviews or media contacts that have, quote, 
possible national or international implications, unquote. It is not at all clear how the system will work, although the U.S. military does have the personnel in place. The Pentagon employs more than 27,000 communication staff. One new rule that the Pentagon has made no mention of, but is probably already in force, don't expect to see any U.S. Army brass sitting down with a Rolling Stone reporter anytime soon. Last month, we talked about how the authorities in Pakistan were out to curb the impact of social media there, sites like Facebook and Twitter. Now, there's a new law under consideration aimed at mainstream media, specifically television. If passed, the law would subject broadcasters to heavy fines and even jail time for airing footage seen as defaming the state or promoting terrorism. The legislation would ban the broadcasting of footage of suicide bombings. It would ban showing the bodies of victims of militant attacks it would also ban publishing statements from extremist leaders. TV discussions of legal cases that could influence court decisions would also be forbidden. The Pakistani media, which has been tough on the Zardari government, is predicting that this new law will be used to silence political critics. The government's firing back, saying that no civilized country gives murderers and terrorists unfettered airtime. Journalists covering the political violence in Somalia remain a big part of that story. Eight journalists were wounded, some of them seriously, when a bomb went off in Mogadishu at a press conference called by the Islamic militant group Al-Shabaab. This follows an attack on a news conference seven months ago that killed three journalists. That attack was blamed on the Al-Shabaab group. Local media workers in Somalia are caught in the middle. They're often accused by both Al-Shabaab and supporters of the transitional government of being biased and deliberately stirring up violence. And reporters working for international media organizations often face intimidation and the threat of being arrested. Al Jazeera journalist Mohamed Addo was arrested in Somaliland recently while trying to cover the country's recent elections. The number of journalists murdered in Mexico this year is already approaching double figures after two more were shot last week. The latest killings involve a married couple, Juan Francisco Rodriguez Rios and Maria Elvira Hernandez Galena. They were gunned down in the internet cafe that they ran in the southwestern state of Guerrero. Rodriguez had been a prominent journalist for 20 years and had recently taken part in a conference about how to deal with the growing threat to journalists in the country. Mexican authorities are struggling to cope with the escalating drug-related violence against journalists. Since 2000, 64 reporters have been murdered, with seven killings already this year, and too often the cases go unsolved. We're back after the break with a piece on the media, China, and a former colony in Southeast Asia that isn't Hong Kong. Welcome back. Way back in 1997, the news media from around the world descended on Hong Kong for what was a major news story, the handing over of a former British colony to China. But two years after that, a similar story passed under the global news radar. China regained control of the former Portuguese colony of Macau. Macau has recently marked the 10th anniversary of that handover. It's known as a gambling mecca, and its economy has thrived in lockstep with the boom in China. But what has the political transition meant for freedom of expression there? Macau still has laws on its books that supposedly guarantee a free press. However, as the Listening Post's Simon Ostrovsky found, closer ties to China mean that the law is not always followed to the letter. Ten years ago, the Portuguese rulers of Europe's last colony in China packed their bags and headed home. Macau was handed over to China, and for the Macanese, the future was uncertain. Today, Macau's economy is booming and it's become the world's top-earning gambling hotspot. But a decade ago, local journalists weren't even certain they'd have a job after the Chinese took over. We were worried uh, that there would be an erosion on the freedom of speech, on our freedom as journalists to work uh, in Macau. But as the economy grew, so did the number of publications and mainland Chinese-style censorship of the media never materialized here. Since Macau was handed back to the People's Republic of China, the economy here has boomed, and so has the media, with a proliferation of new newspapers and magazines, but most of them are supported by the government, and that is a problem for free speech. Just across the border of the Macau Special Administrative Region, mainland China and its authorities keep a tight lid on dissent and still censor content in newspapers, television, and on the internet. But under the One China Two Systems policy, Macau, like Hong Kong, is left to manage its own affairs. Tiny Macau has a population of just over half a million, 
but there are radio and television services in three languages and dozens of newspapers and magazines for both Chinese-speaking and Western readers. Most only survive thanks to government support, and as a result, few dare to criticize the authorities. All media receive subsidies in a huge amount of money. So they survive not because of the publicity of, or by selling newspapers. This, he says, is the reward for papers who tow the government line. A brand new office building given to the privately owned Macau Daily News, free of charge. A decade of change. The 10-year anniversary of Macau's return was big news in mainland China and an opportunity for the government to drum in yet again its narrative of China's rise. China's president Hu Jintao was welcomed with fanfare and praised Macau's leadership, but at least two reporters from Hong Kong were barred from the event by Macau immigration authorities. A number of activists also from Hong Kong who wanted to stage protests around the Hu visit were also turned away. China Central Television ran a number of specials and news reports to mark the anniversary. Despite the relatively small size, Macau has a well-developed media industry. Its story on Macau's media scene for foreign viewers portrayed the territory as a beacon of media freedom. And in what extent is the independence editorial policy that you have when you open this magazine? Completely. João Pinto heads up the Portuguese language portion of Macau's public broadcaster, TDM. He witnessed the handover as a journalist in 1999. It was a very emotional day for me. Uh, I'm a Portuguese. This was the last uh, Portuguese colony in, in the world, in Asia. And there were uh, indeed some worries. Um, moving back to China for some of us meant that we were afraid that our freedom of speech would be somehow diminished or we would have problems in the future. Well, fortunately, nothing uh, happened. There was no erosion in the freedom of speech. There was no cutback on the operations of the Portuguese TV channel. We can cr criticize local officials. We can produce news and current affairs program which debates policies and we do that. But did the same hold true for Macau's Chinese language media? Jose Coutinho of the legislature told me that even at the public broadcaster, his critical remarks were rarely broadcast in Chinese. This is a public local Chinese TV station. And it happens not once. It's every time that I speak, the most important part is omitted and that makes us quite frustrated. Joao Pinto conceded that the rules seem to be different for foreign reporters and their Chinese colleagues. They seldom criticize the government, either the central government or the local government. They seem to exercise a high degree of self-censorship on reporting certain news which might be harmful to the image of Macau or to the image of uh, local leaders. I wanted to find out why that was, but many Chinese journalists I approached said they couldn't talk about the issue on camera. Because I know the Portuguese language media here, they're able to, you know, report pretty much anything they want because mm -hmm. the government isn't really concerned about what they say. Mm -hmm. But for Chinese journalists, is it different? Um, oh, this kind of question, actually, I... <laughs> maybe I have to mention to my boss first. One reporter who was willing to speak to me confirmed that editors did pressure reporters to avoid sensitive topics. They would somehow indirectly um, influence your, your, your news. Like, um, are you sure you have to report in this way? Are you sure you have to say this word, this phrase? Nowadays, maybe everybody on the street knows what is happening in the society, but we just cannot broadcast what we observe. Macau's European past has given it an edge over mainland China in terms of a vibrant media landscape. But even here, it seems, some things are best left unsaid. Yet while the economy continues to expand and Macau's financial fortunes rise, few are likely to question the course the authorities have set out. More Global Village Voices now on the news media in Macau. 
at a time when media organisations all over the world are contracting um, their operations, the Chinese authorities have invested um, billions of dollars into expanding their media operations. While it looks slick, um, it looks more diverse, it's more sophisticated, it still has to represent China's viewpoint. And to China, propaganda is not a degraded form of information, it is information. The Chinese in all kinds of ways are edging into the international system and into what you might call the wider world. Now, they've always thought that the media inside China is very important to get out the party's message. Now, one of the things that they are catching on to is that there are other countries which send out the message not with the expectation that people are going to obey what they read or what they hear, but that people will be persuaded. It's been, on the whole, not very successful with their foreign language press, but I think that they are having more success with a relatively flexible way of putting things on the radio and in television. Finally, here's a video for all you dads out there, all the fathers who are not willing to admit that they're no different to the way their fathers were at about the same age. No, you're much hipper than your dad ever was. The goatee is evidence of that. You still listen to cool music. You dress if not like your kids, then certainly not the way your dad did at the same age. Now, if that sounds familiar, then we've got a web video of the week designed specifically for you. But just remember, while keeping up all those appearances, try not to put out your back. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. This is Dad Life. It's how we live 24-7, 365. Check me. Gas station glasses, don't care what the masses think about me with my sweet goatee. I'm rocking my dockers with a cuff and a crease. I got that St. John's Bay and the clip for my piece. I look nice. I got dozens of dollars and that's right. It goes straight to my daughters and my wife. I'm a miracle dad, making magic with the checkbook. It's the talent I have. It's the dad life. It's the dad life. It's the dad life. Shooting vids of the kids is the dad life. Roll up to the splash pad, 10 a.m. My whole entourage hops out the minivan. We splishy splashy for an hour or two. Then it's back to the house, yeah. prepping for the barbecue. Hey. It's the dad life. Oh. Hit the mall, coaching ball. It's the dad life. It's the dad life. Hey. It's the dad life. Oh. Playing rough, fixing stuff. It's the dad life. It's the dad life. It's the dad life. Yeah, you know how we do it. It's the dad life.